when you're doing a tragedy and you're showing how people fall, you must commit to it. You know, the, the problem with saving the kids in, in the American version of the Pied Piper is you then kind of, you're kind of saying you can always fix it. Which, I mean, yes, sure, you can always try. But the, the example that I like to use is um, take a plate, take your favorite plate in the world and throw it on the ground. Did it break? Yeah. Okay, now tell the plate that you're sorry. Okay, did it fix itself? If the answer is no, there are things that can't be fixed. Releasing your inner dragon. So, Drake, today we want to talk about character arcs. What do you think a story is without character arcs? Literary fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from, but I couldn't resist that once it the popped truth in my head. Slips out. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not a story. It's just not. I mean, well, it's not. Okay. And maybe that is serious. I, I was joking about that. But so literary fiction is experimental storytelling. So mm -hmm. like there was one a couple of years ago that my we were in a bookstore. And my wife brought it over because she was so stunned. It, it had won the the Pulitzer Prize or whatever the big literary award is. Um, is it the Pulitzer Prize? Pulitzer Prize? No, that's a journalist award. Yeah. What? Whatever. Oh, one I don't it, know. There's, there's a couple of. Right. Whatever the big one is. Um, and the back blurb. You know, the thing that the marketing team puts together to entice you to buy it, that is the sales pitch of the book. It literally said, you will not buy this book for the story, the characters, or the plot, because it has none of those. You will buy it strictly for the beauty of how it's, uh, uh, no, not even how it's written, the beauty of how the sentences are constructed. <laughs> and I was like, no, I will not. <laughs> like. So it is experimental. I mean, I pick on literary fiction all the time, especially in my classes, mostly because I'm just not smart enough to actually write something like that. So it's probably out of jealousy. But still, it's experimental a lot of the times. Uh, in genre fiction, what we talk about, what we do, if you're going to make a living at this genre fiction, it doesn't exist without. And again, I'm I'm pausing because I'm like, wait a minute, there is a different, there is one exception to that. Most of it is not going to happen without a character arc because we're going to do an internal story arc. And so for the plot or for the theme to be consumed by the audience, the character has to have an arc. There is external story arcs. So we go with like Lord of the Flies or V for Vendetta, but there is still a character arc. It's just now the world's character arc. The world has to grow. And it's the reason why they don't sell as much because they're much more esoteric and harder to really understand on an individual basis as opposed to you know batman struggling to do something i was gonna go, i was gonna go with luke Skywalker and star wars but we're trying to avoid that in today's podcast that's why i was frodo frodo in in lord of the rings has got a a, a character arc um he starts out as like right. i'm a tiny hobbit i can't do it and and in the end well, in the end, Sam can do it, but you know, <laughs> he does right. he does get there to a right. certain extent. Right. Um but yeah, I mean they there have been I, I agree with you on that. I don't think that you can write a fantasy story and have no character arcs. I think that your audience is expecting to see character growth. Even if it is as simple as the farm boy who knows nothing grows into the competent leader, warrior, mage, whatever he's growing into. 100%. Yeah. What about you? Do you feel what do you, I think? Yeah. What, do you feel you can have a story without a character arc? <laughs> no. No, I, I don't. Well, hmm. I suppose you could if you were writing it with the external arc. Right. Heck. So. But if you're writing it with an external arc, man, you need a you need a strong central theme, and every single character is on one side or the other side of that theme. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of people get yeah. really confused on external arcs because your main characters aren't actually characters. That's why they don't have arcs. They're allegories. They're allegories for one side of the theme or the other. 
So mm. that's yeah. that's why we don't we don't relate to them as as audience members because it's like, what do you mean he's he literally is rigid because he's an idea. Like people aren't ideas, and like, well, actually, kind of in this type of story, they're they're, they're an allegory. So yeah, that's so when you take V from a dead, it's the same thing. You know, V is not a character. He's an allegory for it is better to give up um, safety for freedom. Like that's yeah. what he is. And he can't change because it'll ruin the story. Yeah. So yeah, it's, those are tougher. Yeah. Uh, but if you're writing an internal arc, which what which is what most of us are doing. Um, There's one other and, way that just popped and, in my mind. Oh yeah? Peripheral narrator. Now the peripheral narrator should grow because that's the, so like in The Great Gatsby, um, Nick Carraway is not the protagonist, you know, Gatsby's the protagonist, but Nick Carraway grows. He yeah. does learn through that, you know, exchange. So he mm. absolutely has a character arc, but I can see a situation where you could maybe be successful where the peripheral narrator connects to the reader and they become like this surrogate for watching this thing of this growth. But, you know, most other stories, I mean, Sherlock Holmes is a peripheral narrator in Watson, but Watson grows. Yeah. Um, you know, same thing with Carraway and Great Gatsby, whatever. So yeah. I can see if maybe if your it off. protagonist is not going to grow, then I think you you must have a peripheral narrator. Oh, 100 percent I mean, that's the whole reason for yeah. Sherlock Holmes and the Great Gatsby yeah. being that way. Yeah. But I think that we should also talk about the types of character arcs that you can have because it yeah. doesn't all have to be sunshine and roses actually i was going to before that because that's a part of this i was going to ask you so what is the definition of a character arc because that'll lead to yeah you know, the different types so a character arc is the growth a character undergoes and understand that i'm not saying here that it's the character learns how to throw fireballs yeah skill can be part of the character arc especially if you're talking about somebody whose whose growth arc is about them being unsure of themselves because they're low skilled they learn a skill and that gives them confidence in themselves that's fine then skill is part of it but it is not the actual arc <laughs> the arc is the process of overcoming their Flaw, their emotional impediment or giving into it right yeah. so every character should have a flaw it doesn't have to be a fatal flaw necessarily although the greeks had a good thing going with fatal flaws but they have to have a flaw that is impacting them and putting them on the wrong side of the feet their but, growth arc is either overcoming and that. succumbing it's hmm? interesting you said that um because I've never thought about it that way. I mean, to me, it's all, it's just called the fatal flaw because that's what it is. Mm. But you're right. Some of my fatal flaws, they're definitely not fatal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just, you know, when when I say you give a character a fatal flaw, I never thought about the fact that maybe I was I was painting a picture bigger than what needs to happen. Um, so that's an interesting way to look at it, or at least to define fatal flaw, that it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to die because they are have this stupid thing. Um, like so, Marlon in Finding Nemo, yeah. his fatal flaw is he's an overprotective parent. And it is fatal because it gets his child kidnapped. Like, yeah. that's horrible. Because you were a certain way and you couldn't get over that. Now your child is kidnapped. So it's it's a really bad flaw. But so so the Greeks with their fatal flaws, look, the Greeks, Greeks were obsessed with writing tragedies. If you read read the Greek stories, they're all tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. And it's always a tragedy because of a fatal flaw that the hero has. And he can't overcome it. And that turns it into a tragedy. <laughs> like, um, so I, I don't like to use the words fatal flaw because to me it ties back to, you know, Oedipus and Jason and um, Odysseus and Hercules and every single Greek hero that ended up in a really, really bad situation because... <laughs> this is just what happens to Greek heroes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like I said, that's why when you said yeah. that, I was like, huh, that's interesting. Maybe people are getting the wrong impression because I just, I've always just used the term, well, your character has to have a fate of law. Mm. And, and what I mean, what, what I mean by that, and I think what you mean by that is just 
they have to have something that's going to cause them grief as the story goes on that is tied thematically into the theme that you're pushing because that's how everything's going to kind of be driven through the story so that's exactly. really what i mean by fatal flaw yes so they they have to have a thematic flaw a, a, a flaw that is related to the theme or to their theme and that overcoming that flaw is their positive growth arc if they don't overcome it if they succumb to the flaw they have a negative growth arc a character that doesn't not necessarily doesn't have flaws but doesn't change doesn't either overcome or go down it's got a flat arc and there is a good reason to include flat arc characters because if every character has growth then you're going to ask too much of the reader right and your your stu- your story is going to lose impact because it's going to be diluted over too many characters right um so you kind of glossed over them so i do want to kind of at least hammer on those so you went through them all there are basically three types of um character arcs i mean there's different ways to look at it depending on who you want to study or whatever but like you said there's positive story arcs which means we're going to and and really all of these are tied into the theme everything about a character arc to to me and marie are tied into the theme that's that's how we deliver our theme is through the character arcs. So if it's a positive story arc, then they're going to start on the wrong side of the theme. And through trials and tribulations, the story is going to slap them in the face constantly and say, hey, look, you're if you just would change. And then at the end, they're going to make the change to the correct side of the theme and good things are going to happen to them. It's going to be a positive story. It's a feel good story. You know, you're excited that they that they did what they did and it makes you feel good. You get the, the the feel goods at the end of the story. A negative story arc is usually a tragedy. I mean, there might be some other ways, but I'm just going to go with it on the easy thing and just call it a tragedy. And it's where the character starts on the wrong side of the theme. The story is going to show them and the reader that they're on the wrong side of the theme and all their troubles are because of that. But because they never move, the only way for the reader to consume that their side is bad is to have horrible things happen to that character. So it's going to be a, you know, it's going to end in a negative way. You could even, you could go further. You could put the character on the right side of the theme at the start of the story and have them literally fall straight past the theme, <laughs> which would really, like, it it could make it a very interesting tragedy. If you think of, like, the great Shakespearean tragedies, some of the characters actually start on the right side. Yeah. And then fall into the wrong side. Yeah. So that's basically that. And then the flat arc, just like you said, it just means that the character doesn't really have any growth through it. So we already talked about um, external story arcs where Mm. your characters are actually just allegories. So obviously they're going to have flat story arcs. The world is going to have an arc. The world is going to grow. It's going to start on the wrong side almost always. So um in both Lord of the Flies and in V for Vendetta, the two examples I use, they both start on the uh, wrong side of the theme. You know, V for Vendetta starts in a world that has already given up freedom for safety. And in Lord of the Flies, it's already started off with all the kids are just kind of good and playing around and having a good time and, you know, getting along. And we're going to prove that all humans are born evil. So, you know, and again, you don't have to agree with the theme. It's just that's what the story does. You know, yep. that's what it plays with in its messaging. So, yeah. And yeah. so we had some examples that we kind of skipped over. And I think it's important uh, to come up with those. So like a positive, we already kind of talked about the Marlin story arc from yeah. Finding Nemo. That's a positive. It, it, it's feel goods. Um, we talked about several of the negatives already. But the one we actually came up with before the podcast that I really liked was Walter White. You know, his fatal I flaw is that. he's not going to take anything off anybody. He's done. Like the world has, has you know, pooped on me and I'm just done. I'm not going to, mm. and it, it literally kills him. Like he just refuses. He refuses to give up the fact that he is just an arrogant, pig headed, stubborn, you know, SOB that's just not going to take anything off of anybody because it's, he deserves it. I deserve better. Um, I mean, and it, like there's, they did such a great job with that too, because there was times which like, like the, the story would literally say another character would be like, you have five pallets of cash sitting in a warehouse like how much more do you want 
You know, there's they're all hundred bills. There's there's three million dollars there. So yep. and he's like, doesn't matter, not enough. And so <laughs> there's that. And then we and he about- literally, literally ends himself in you know, ends up in tragedy. Yeah, because he will not give it up. Even yeah. it doesn't matter how successful he got. Um and I mean that's a great thematic element for modern times. I mean, how many people just through corporate life or whatever ruin their marriage and their children's lives and their lives and they become alcoholics and you know the whole nine yards because they just won't stop being driven. There, there, there is no level of success that well, oh my God, this was such a horrifying, terrible thing that happened. So the the new Reacher that's on Amazon Prime, the Jack Reacher show. Oh. Okay. I, I I don't watch that one, but okay. <laughs> really good. Really well done. The actor in it is this gorgeous, gorgeous dude, ripped. Um, I can't remember his name, but I fell in love with him as an actor, not just because he's all hunky, but but he's a really good actor too, in a really crappy B sci-fi television show that was kind of like Death Race, where basically you just ran across the country killing people in your city and, and your other people. And it was and the cars were actually magical and they only ran off of blood. And I think it was like called Blood Sport or something like that or Blood Race or something. <laughs> so you actually had to murder people and feed it to the cars, which are demonic, so that you could keep going. Very horrible, you know, and which is why I watched it. I loved every minute of it. It was fantastic. Yeah. But I really fell in love with him as an actor. And he's, you know, like a lot of actors, he's just struggled, struggled, struggled. And then he gets the the Reacher role, mm. blows up. It's massively successful, well-written, well-produced, well-everything. He's the perfect role. I mean, Tom Cruise is a great actor, but Jack Reacher is described as a big buff dude. And mm. Tom Cruise, <laughs> he's not a big buff dude. No, he's not. So it was great. I loved all the, the Tom Cruise Reacher stuff, too. Yeah. Because it does, you know, normally in a, you know, in a kind of a spy type thing, you don't have to be this massive, muscular, you know, Conan yeah. kind of dude. But he really fits the role closer to the books and all this other stuff. And it's fantastic. And then he's doing an interview not too long ago, a couple months ago. And he's like, and then I went up to the roof and I hung myself. Now, this is after he had his role with, you know, Reacher, after he reached it and you know, he talked about how, you know, because they were like, why would you do that? I mean, you're at the you've you've been struggling for 20 years to get to here and you finally reach it. And he's like, honestly, because I thought I was doing the world a favor. I thought I was doing my family a favor. I thought it was, you know, and so. But talk about a, a character arc where, you know. You have this this struggle through this entire thing. And yet Mm. still, I'm I'm just tying it back to the, uh, it's a real world version of the Walter White character where you're just so driven and you just can't. So then you, and so that, I mean, because we all heard the stories where you, the the musicians or whatever, they finally hit massive rock and roll fame and they kill themselves. And you're like, what? Like, I'm scratching out a living just to pay rent. Like, Mm. why would you do that? And, you know. They're they're so driven. They can't live with the success. Yeah. And yeah. and now he's their... open up about it. Obviously, he survived the, the yeah. suicide attempt. Um, and he's open up about it. He's a he's now really advocating for mental health and and mm. depression and suicide and all of that, you know, obviously. Yeah. Uh that's why I can tell this story because he told this story. I wouldn't have known it otherwise. Um, <laughs> not like we're friends or anything. He this is just yeah. something I watched the him do an interview. Yeah. So um, so yeah, I mean. You know, we talk a lot about themes and how the only thing for a theme to be impactful is it has to, you know, the the person has to be born human. So that story right there, struggling for fame, you know, struggling for success, not even fame, but struggling for success to make it in this world. Everyone, it's a tough, it's a tough world. Um, it's depression and, you know, feeling like a failure and, you know, thoughts of suicide and maybe even, you know, attempted suicide and all that. These are all human elements. We all can relate to it we can empathize with it and everything like that so you know you look at walter white and the the breaking bad series and you're like why would that story be such a success it's literally about a complete narcissistic jerk who becomes a drug lord and murders people like like why it was that because it was filled 
with human. Now they're the darker elements, but it's filled with these human thematical elements that we all go. Mm, yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe a different morning. I wake up a little bit different. Maybe I go down that path. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that's the thing. Negative arcs, negative growth arcs can be very satisfying, but then you have to commit to the tragedy. Mm -hmm. Like Macbeth would not have the same thematic impact if they survived and took the throne. Yeah. <laughs> well, neither um, would Hamlet, neither would Hamlet. Like yeah. you need to commit to the tragedy if you're going to write a negative growth arc. Yeah, because what the audience gets out of it because the, is... the problem, the bigger problem, sorry, as well, is if you don't commit to the tragedy, you're literally saying that actually, see, actually, this is the correct behavior. And it is okay to be a narcissistic jerk because you win in the end. Right. And yeah, so that shouldn't be a message is, um, you want to put into the world. Like, <laughs> Right. And that's what I was going to say. The reason why it has to be is because um, a feel-good story, a thematic element where the character moves, it makes the, the, the people want to be better because they're like, oh, wow, look at this. A tragedy must be a warning. So it's like um, the Pied Piper. Every time I use that as an example in class. I always say, you know, everybody knows the story of the Pied Piper. Um, there's a village that's overrun by rats. A dude shows up with a magic flute and says, I can get rid of the rats if you just pay me X amount of money. And they're like, great. And he plays his magic flute. He takes the rats to the ocean. They, you know, he drowns them. He comes back. He's like, where's my money? And they're like, yeah, well, you're just one weird dude with a flute. We're not going to pay you. And he goes, fine, not a big deal. He plays his magic flute. All the village children follow him down to the ocean and they drown themselves. Now, every time I say that here in the state, like, you're just like, yeah, that's the story. In the States, that's not the story. In the states, not the story. That is the, the story. Because in the states, <laughs> he plays his magic flute, and all the children start following him to the ocean, and the villagers go, "Oh no, wait, 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 wait! We're sorry. Here's your money." And he goes, "Okay, thought so." And he takes the money and he leaves. I'm like, "No, no, no! You broke your promise. Your children die. Like that's the <laughs> point. Like you don't whitewash this." So yeah, like when I say it here in the states, they're like, that, "That's not the story I remember." I'm like. Yeah, that's the original story. That's the European version of the story. And so I always go to that because that's <laughs> that's what you, you know, that's the point. The 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 story is, and some people get greed out of it. And that's the thing about th themes, since you can't say them, it doesn't matter if if you exactly hit the mark. So to me, it's about keeping your promises. But mm -hmm. to other people, it's like, don't be greedy. Okay, great. Both are great messages. It really doesn't. I don't think that the Grimm... Uh, the Brothers Grimm were like, oh, no, don't you dare think it's about this one theme when it's actually about this other. So, so I mean, the the pie, pie, all those fairy tales actually come from like, I mean, the, the Brothers Grimm, what they did was they went around Europe and collected them and wrote them down. Yep. Those fairy tales come from deep, deep roots. Yep. You know, they're, yep. they're told, tales that have been told around the fire for, for centuries. And they have multiple messages and they've shifted over the years because that's the nature of these kind of folklore tales. Yeah. But you are 100% correct. Like when you're doing a tragedy and you're showing how people fall, you must commit to it. You know, the, the problem with saving the kids in, in the American version of the Pied Piper is you then kind of, you're kind of saying you can always fix it, which I mean, yes, sure, you can always try. But the, the example that I like to use is, um, take a plate, take your favorite plate in the world and throw it on the ground. Did it break? Yeah. Okay, now tell the plate that you're sorry. Okay, did it fix itself? If the answer is no, there are things that can't be fixed. I mean, just to put a, a nail in this, it literally is that. It's when you're telling a story, you can't mention your theme ever. So the only way to get the audience to consume that theme, if it's a feel good, it's because the problem happened because they're on the wrong side. And the solution was moving to the right side. And if it's a tragedy, the problem happened because it's on the wrong side. And then it ends horribly for them because they never would change or grow or understand the issue. Yeah. Um, because again, as I say many, many, many times, the only thing, none of this is real. The character doesn't grow. The character doesn't not grow. No one dies. No one gets wins. No one becomes king. The only thing that's real is the reader. And so it's about them. And how are we going to get them to consume that? It, it can also be, as I said, they can start on the wrong side and transition it on the right side and transition mm -hmm. oh, to yeah. the wrong side. Yeah. Um, like I'm I'm reminded again of, of Blue Eyed Samurai. And this is actually in the backstory, which you find out through flashbacks and a couple of other devices. Um, 
the character at one point was a happy married woman doing woman wife stuff and she was fine and then she there was a triggering event and she learned all the wrong lessons and turned into a stone cold killer in response and that is a falling on like you were there you were a happy person you were an unhappy person <laughs> i feel like that's so. also it's been too long so i can't nail it but i feel like that's also the backstory to kill bill <laughs> It's always possible. <laughs> I remember her in a wedding dress at the at some point in the beginning. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so so you can definitely do that. Now, I guess other questions about character arc is who who should get an arc? Because as I said, you don't want to have everybody have the arc. So who do you think should have an arc? So in my opinion, again, because character arcs to me are completely tied into theme, it's it's how I deliver my theme. It's all about the theme. Like, that's it. That's the story. I don't want to muddy the waters. So, yeah, I don't mind my secondary characters growing some. They'll learn a lesson along the way, but only because it's a minor theme that that feeds into the major theme of the character arc. So for me, now I have multiple main characters, but for me, the main characters are the ones that are going to have the big growth arcs. And my secondary characters will learn a lesson along the way, but really more to teach the the audience something that maybe the main arc doesn't do or something to tell teach the main arc so that they also learn something. Uh, so, and then that's it. I mean, again, it comes down to the, storytelling is not real uh, as far as like it's not real world stuff. And so you can't go, oh, well, it would happen this way in the real world. Okay, great. But we're, we we need them to consume a message that we can't say to them. And so you can't be, you know, real world because then they you muddy the waters and then they since you've never mentioned it, they don't know what you're saying. Yeah. And so that's to me the thing. I mean, the main character is going to have the the main growth arc. I mean, look at Finding Nemo. Dory doesn't grow in that movie. the The dentist doesn't grow in that movie. the The sharks didn't grow. The stone turtle doesn't grow. Like those are very flat story arcs. Marlin grows. Nemo grows and that's it. But that is what is important as well about flat arcs because flat arcs help the growth arc stand out. And flat arcs provide stability to the story. So I 100% agree with they you. They almost don't... act hmm? like allegories. They almost act like allegories. You want your main characters to, you want your POV characters. Definitely every POV character must have a growth. Yeah. Now I do try and thread some growth into my, what I call my primary secondary characters. So if I'm thinking of like Sangwheel Chronicles, for example, Louis has Raul, his best friend and Giselle. Um, Isabella has herself who's attached to her. And of course herself's also attached to Louis. And Nayira has her two husbands. So those char those characters that are so close to the other, to the primary characters, to the POV characters, for them, I try and thread in a growth. Mm -hmm. Because they are so close to the main characters and the the reader almost sees them as protagonists because but they you, are close. But you do a good job of never letting them overshadow yes. the stories. Of the protagonist of the POVs. Yes. And that is very important mm -hmm. because it is very easy to let a character overshadow the the narrating character, especially like Isabella, for example, is a child character who is blind. It is very, very easy to have her get lost <laughs> in like the kerfuffle of a scene. And you have to be very conscious that the narrating character is the important part because the narrating character is what the reader is attached to. It doesn't matter how cool all the other people are acting. If the narrating character is not part of the scene. Yeah. I mean, I don't have anything to add to any of that. It's, <laughs> it is, it is the way it is. So let's take a more of a 10,000 foot approach. Do you feel genre has anything to do with, with character arcs? I 
don't think so. I think that character arcs are so universal in human themes that it doesn't make a difference. Now I say that and I want to say this one caveat, <laughs> and that is in romance. Because to an extent, romance has extremely limited character arcs. Like Mills and Boone romance. You know, the 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 very like the hundred pages of of I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back on that just a little okay. bit. And I realize I haven't written romance in, you know, yeah. almost a decade now. Um you are correct in your harlequin romance, you know, that genre but there are many genres of romance and like sweet romance that i write i'm basically just writing fantasy i just make sure that the central uh story arc is the romance and then the thematic elements that i'm playing within the story are are secondary to that that role because yeah, yeah. the romance fan is going to want to read the romance first and then i'm kind of piggybacking on that to also give them a message outside yeah. of romance so, so yes, you're right. Certain genres of of romance, hundred percent. Like yeah. there, because there, there are there are a couple of genres of romance that are really really light yeah. <laughs> on the growth, yeah. and I guess like middle grade fiction. So uh, and I, I, what I mean by middle grade fiction is like the famous five and the Hardy Boys. There isn't much character growth in those. Like I mean, it, it has been a long time since I read those books. But there isn't much character growth in them because part of the joy of reading them is that the characters don't change. Yeah. I mean, I see that more in mystery. I mean, even yeah. adult mystery, the characters, I mean, Perot. Mm, doesn't change. Yeah, he doesn't change. Yeah. Um, you could say Sherlock, but technically he's not the POV character. So, yeah. but Perot yeah. is. Yeah. Um, so, you know. I think so, it's more of a mystery thing that your detective I, doesn't I get to that much. The, I think perhaps the formulaic genres don't that, have much character growth. You literally nailed it. I, that That's it. Everything we're talking about leads down to, if you're doing the formulaic, the, the mystery, the, the certain types of romance, stuff like that, mm. your character is probably not going to have, because those are genre-driven yes. stories. You know, there's a murder to solve. There yeah. is a heart to warm. Yeah. The the people who the, the people who are consuming it want that stability of character. They right. do not want a big change. They're consuming it for a different a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. They're there for the romance. They're there for yeah. the mystery. They're there for whatever yeah. you know it is they're doing. Yeah. So yeah, you, no... I think you got to the heart of it right there. Yeah. And if you try and throw in a character arc there you're probably going to miss your audience. They're probably not going to like you. <laughs> um, Although you get some cross. I mean, like Knives <laughs> Out. I think Knives cool. Out is one of the reasons why it was so popular with, with that kind of branched out of your normal mm -hmm. mystery things is because it, you know, they also tried to do more with the story than just a murder mystery. A hundred percent. But I mean, it's not like you, you have to be very specific and you're probably only going to write one. Right, you're not going to write twenty books like that. <laughs> I mean, and the right, purpose right. of these formulaic genres is for you to write twenty books right. <laughs> that yeah. all follow the same pattern. Because you know, the average romance reader will read thirty to fifty romance novels a year, and I'm talking about just the average. Some of them are reading, you know, two hundred, three hundred right. in a year, and so to keep up well, with that kind of demand. Obviously, yeah. they're not remembering any of this stuff. They're not remembering the difference between them. They're looking for, you know, like with romance, I mean, depending on which type of romance you're you're writing, they're looking for that feeling that they get inside. Yeah. Uh, now, whether that feeling is higher in their body or lower in their body depends on the genre of, <laughs> of romance, but they're still looking for that feeling inside. Yeah. So and, and they don't that, care yeah, about the characters. So, but other than the formulaic genres... Yeah, I I would say no, no. And please understand, I'm not insulting the formulaic genres. At oh no, here. I've consumed plenty of formulaic. I learned to read on formulaic. Yeah, um, I have fond memories of reading a lot of Famous Five. So, yeah. um, but but in the formulaics, you're not you're not going to have growth arcs. Or not at least usually. Not, not, yeah. not usually. Yeah. Um, and the reason why, um, 
and if I'm putting words in your mouth, correct me, but the reason why I don't think that uh, genre matters is because since especially me and you look at character arcs in a very thematic way, it's there to deliver the theme. Hmm. Themes are human. Themes are not fantasy. Themes are not sci-fi. Themes are not Western. You know, hmm. they're human. They're, it doesn't, we're just, you know, I said this in class this weekend where I said, because somebody asked me about genres and it was kind of close to this, but I basically said, look, genres exist so that we can attract a, a certain type of customer in to consume a message. Um, I can, you know, if I write Western, if I want to do, if I want to talk about racism, I can pull in, you know, I can do it in Western and then pull in those, but I'm not going to pull in somebody that like sci-fi, but I can write a sci-fi story that explores the perils of racism. And then I can write a fantasy story and then I can write a mystery and then I can write. So I, so you use the genres because those, and I also said this, cause that's kind of leads to it. Genres exist because and I think a lot of writers miss this fact. What we do is fantasy fulfill. That's literally the baseline of our job. We're fan Why am I such a huge epic fantasy fan? Because when I was a kid, I wanted to ride dragons. I wanted to slay dragons. I wanted to cast fireballs. I'm attracted to that for fantasy. And so the writer can then use my love of dragons and magic and all that to also then have me consume messages of the, you know, from the story. But you could do that same message in any genre. You're just going to pull that crowd or this yeah. crowd. But we can we can absolutely do any message that we want through any of the stories uh, through the thematic element. So I agree 100 percent that I don't think genre, except for, like I said, it was so funny that you come up with that because we kind of struggled with that before the podcast. We did that was brilliant. And now I do want to just say that there was one formulaic writer that I do recollect actually did have a, th a theme every time, but he had the same character growth arc every every book, mm. um, with just with different characters. And that was, uh, it's a Western author, your Western reminded it, it was Zane Grey. Mm. So he, he, I don't know, 50 million, 789 gazillion Western books, right? <laughs> but they all follow the same pattern. There's the strong, silent man, who learns to be gentler because he falls in love with a woman. Every book is the same character growth arc, but it's great. It's a lot of fun, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was back in the day when you got paid by the word and that was it. So you just wrote fast. You just wrote. And so if you can write, I mean, like Nora Roberts, if you've read one Nora Roberts story, you've read every Nora Roberts story. She just puts different window dressing. She takes the story and then she changes the curtains and she puts a new you know, cover on the couch. And then there you go. And then she takes the story and she does it again. And she takes the story and she does it again. And like, but that's fine. That's... I wish. <laughs> yeah. She's sitting on a pile of money. So oh, yeah. I wish. <laughs> no, yeah. This is not me picking on Nora Roberts in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. <laughs> because there is an audience that just they they're not looking for you know we're fantasy fans so you know we're looking for depth and culture and physics and like if we you know that's why stories like that bore us and you know again it's just that's our thing and some people's thing they're looking for something complete they're still fantasy fulfilling yeah. they're just looking for a different you know like my wife my wife is a huge murder mystery fan. She reads them. She listens to them. She watches them on TV. That's her thing. I don't. They're boring to me. It's it's like, oh, look, you had a killer and he gets caught at the end. Shocking. Um, and then, oh, look, it's another one where there's another killer who gets caught at the end. Shocking. I'm so I'm so blown away by the ending of this movie. You know, not not to pick on that, but she does not break rules. She thinks that everyone should follow every rule period regardless you know she's a kindergarten teacher so she's not you know she's she's got a very fine or narrow view of you know what the world should be and she doesn't yeah. live in that world and she's definitely not married to that world um so when she goes to fantasy fulfill she wants to fantasy fill in a world where laws are always followed justice is always served nothing is you know nothing ever goes wrong um as far as like the justice yeah. side of it you know it's a chaotic world but it's always fixed you know the yeah. murder always goes to jail or whatever and so she's absolutely fantasy fulfilling you know just like me and you are fantasy feeling when we go into lord of the rings or you know star wars or whatever 
Um, so it's the same exact thing. And I think a lot of writers miss that. Yeah. And that is why like genre does matter in your delivery of the arc, but you should try for a character arc in your, in whatever genre you're writing. So I think that we should start delving into crappy arcs versus satisfying arcs and how you can differentiate between this and mistakes writers make in delivering their arcs. And I will kick us off because I want to talk about a topic that is somewhat controversial and sometimes Actually, wait. generate. Yeah. Before you get there, because I was literally okay. thinking like, where do we start on this? Do we start at the beginning or the end? Hmm. I want to start at the end. So let me just okay. do this real quick and then we'll go. Because the reality is at the end of the day, you don't know if you yeah. created a good arc or, or a bad arc. You don't. You do the best you can. And then hopefully you're smart enough to realize that you don't want to just put, because you're like, oh, I love this story. I'm going to absolutely put it out to the world. Because again, once you start getting reviews on Amazon, they're there for the rest of your life. They don't come down. No, you can't take them down. You can't request them being taken down. They're there forever. So the only way to know if you've succeeded with your character arc is to have people read it and tell you, because it always is going to succeed with you. You're always going to love it because you came up with it. You have to test it out. You because And the reason why I, I stopped you is because you're about to prove that point in the fact that you're the, the reader, you're the mm -hmm. fan, and you're about to critique something that was done. Yes. And, and, and they didn't. Now, it's a different thing, and they don't have time for all this stuff, although they do in other areas. They could have right, spent right, 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 some right. freaking money. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, I'm not, yeah, 100%. But yeah. the lesson is, is, and, you know, this goes to one of my Drake-isms, Drake rule of 10. If you want to know if you succeeded or something, you get 10 people who don't care about you, not your mom, not your spouse, not your friends, because they're going to lie to you. They'll, they'll tell you they're telling you the truth. And, you, and I know you're thinking, oh, no, my friend is always brutal to me. No, he's not. Like, he's brutal. He's brutal to the level that he knows you're cool with. He's not brutal. He's brutal at your comfort level. And, you know, it's just the way it is because he actually cares about you or she actually cares about you. So you get 10 people that don't care about you. That's why I say a writer's group. And then you get honest feedback on it. And if it hurts, it's okay because it just means that you thought you did something that you didn't achieve. So the only way to test it out is to test it out. Um, and that's it. That's really it. So you do your best and then you get it out there because it's always the audience that are going to decide whether you impacted them with your story arc or not. So that's how you test it. That's how you decide whether you've succeeded or not. You can't decide and that. The audience I, I, decides I, it. Yeah. I just want to say as well, like don't get hung up on one beta reader. Oh yeah, What no. you want is you want like 10 to 20 so that you can look at 80% versus 20%. Because there were always, there are people who hate my writing style. There are people, there's, there's somebody who's given me a one star in Amazon. It's not enough to bring me down below four, but somebody hated my book enough to give it a one star. Yeah. It happens. Right? Look, I'm sorry. I'll change it if I ever change my mind. You can stop yeah. bringing it up. <laughs> yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, but um, you, the, the, the thing is, what you want is you want 80% of the people who read it to say to you, this character's arc was this, and it satisfied me. And then you know that you've done it right. How much of a douche move, move would that be to be the only book that I've ever blurbed in my entire life and <laughs> give it <a> one star <laughs> review? Uh, anyway, it's sorry. okay. You've already you've already left your indelible mark on the book. You can't go back on it now. <laughs> True. Um. Yeah, so I just wanted to go yeah. there. That's how we test it. And you're right, it's 80% because we want four out of five stars. Um, I had a, a, a it's not really, she's not really a beta reader, but you know, I'm I'm always getting people to read stuff or whatever. And so I'm not going to go into why, but this person had access to my work in progress. And so she went ahead and answered the beta questions. And she did give me some things to think about because always, but and I don't normally give feedback on people's feedback. There's no point in it. They believe what they believe. They feel what they feel. They're right. They're hundred percent right. You can, you can use it or not, but they're right in their opinion. But I did write her back and I was like, 
so you know thank you so much for the feedback i do have something to say though and i don't usually give feedback to what i you know when somebody gives me feedback but i will say that you've said some comments where you are solely unique in how you looked at this like no one else had said you know went down the paths that she went down saw the things that she saw and you know the things she saw it was negative to her but literally no one has ever gone down and i didn't either i, I like so so it was interesting and it does make me now go hmm you know is there some way to to mitigate that or do i just say nope this is literally one person in you know a lot that feels is, this way you can't like you no, can't please, please everyone everybody. and the thing is readers have got so much of their own baggage that you need to be cognizant of so uh, that you need to be cognizant of their commentary um, like I, for example, for me, the Jade saga hit wrong in its treatment of substance abuse, mm -hmm. right? But I am in the minority. The Jade saga is running at a 4.5 average. Most people love it. Most people that I mentioned this to push back and say, no, they handled it fine. I'm like, and that's fine. Those people are correct. But I am also correct in how it affected me. Yep. Because these it's things subjective. affect us differently because of our different life experiences. Yes. What you want to do as a writer is you want to make sure your target audience is going to respond the way you want them to respond to your themes. And that's the other thing. I don't even know if she, this person, this, this could literally be the very first fantasy thing she's ever read in her entire life. I don't know. She could be a massive fantasy fan too. Literally, I don't have that information. Uh, yeah. So... That's that's the other thing is like you that's why this genre is so important because you wanting to hit right for the right audience yep that's why i always i always bring up my only two-star review on goodreads i mm -hmm. have i mean it's long and it's mm -hmm. funny because he makes fun of me the entire way but the first line of it in my opinion negates everything because it says i don't like fantasy but <laughs> it's like <laughs> you're out your opinion right. does not matter. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, all right. So, but now let's talk about what you can do yes. about bad fantasy, bad character arcs, and how you can identify them and how you can avoid them. And we're going to talk about rings of power. And there have been a lot of people who've dunked on rings of power for all the wrong reasons. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of people who dunk on it for like, I don't know, having a black elf and whatever. None of that bothers me. Okay. Now, there's a lot of people who dunk on rings of power for Galadriel being overpowered. I also don't have a problem with that. Because I think that her being overpowered is the core of her growth arc. But they did the growth arc poorly. Or they executed it poorly. Okay. So... What I think they were aiming for, and I'll tell you why, I'll show you the signposts that they hit along the way. And then we can discuss why they didn't execute it well, despite the signposts. So right in the beginning, we're introduced to Galadriel being super overpowered, even compared to other elves. Yeah? She is obscenely overpowered, but she is arrogant with it. She is so driven, she refuses to give up even when her companions are dying around. Her. And they have to force her into giving it up. And she just wants to keep driving and driving. And she's killing them. Her arrogance is killing them. Yeah? Then she goes back home. And the king, clearly seeing that she is more of a harm than a help here, sends her to the... Um, to the Western realms, right? He sends her across the ocean. And in her wisdom, in her arrogance, she decides, no. She's not going to obey the king. She's going to dive over the side. Yeah, And all of that arrogance even ties into Tolkien's um, commentary around elves, which is that they are arrogant. Tolkien's elves have always had the flaw of arrogance. Right? So 100%, she dives in. Now, I think that that was a stupid like, move, but I understand what they were trying to show. They're showing how she disobeys the king. Yeah? Because she believes that she knows better. All right. It is all kind of setting up this flaw of arrogance. Then, who does she find on the raft? She finds Halbrin. 
Now, spoiler, if you haven't watched the season one yet, and if you haven't, I don't know what you've been doing with your time because it's been out for like two years. So, <laughs> but um, Halbrand is Sauron. All right. Now they do show you, like they do give you some signposts here because there's a shadow of Halbrand and Galadriel and you can see Sauron's helmet outlined in the shadow that Halbrand uh, casts, Halbrand casts. So they're definitely like foreshadowing, right? Um, and she rescues him and she brings him back with her. And they then end up with the humans. And then again, her arrogance almost causes her to fail in the human kingdom. And she's rescued by the guy who becomes um, Aragorn's great ancestor's father. You know, that, that dude. Anyway, I can't remember the name right now. Um, but <laughs> it starts with an A. Um, but he rescues her from her faux pas in court. Okay. And he manages to get her to shut up long enough for him to handle the politics because her arrogance is literally sinking the alliance between elves and men. But then <laughs> they create too much noise around this arc by having the humans be like, elves will not replace us, which is just that line was just so stupid. It was like, like there was just such fundamentally dumb lines there that they kind of ground out that important element of the storyline, which is showing again her arrogance being a problem. Um, and then right at the culmination of the of this of season one, her arrogance literally put Sauron into the position to be able to forge the rings of power. Literally. And she's like, I will stop you. And he's like, no, 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 you won't. And he freezes her and goes and does it because he is Sauron and she is not. Um, and so I can see what they were aiming for. What they're aiming for with her storyline, at least what I believe they were aiming for with her storyline, is that she's arrogant. She's causing her own injuries, even despite all her power. And she is unleashing evil into the world because of her arrogance. Mm -hmm. Right. And she her arc should therefore be learning humility mm -hmm. and that does work well with an overpowered character mm -hmm. i don't think they pulled it off despite the fact that i can see it right yeah um and what i said and, and i i yeah. said this because i do not like lord uh, rings of power um yeah. and i've never made that you know a secret mm. i hope that Marie is correct. I really do. Uh, that's an interesting story. That's a story that I want to see. And the fact of the matter is, is that we're, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. So season two is going to come out eventually. Who knows when they keep pushing it back. Um, and they're, you know, the story is, you know, the story is either going to prove Marie right or, or it could be that Marie is just a way better storyteller. And because a lot of writers, unfortunately, drop things into a story that, someone so like last night in the critique group um one of the readers did this thing and i was like so this is prime callback when because it's a short story and i'm like everything that happens in the actual event so the the person played a video game and it was all flawless and then you know that this that where it's going is going to be horrendous for this character uh it's more than likely going to be a tragedy is what i'm thinking i was like i hope that everything that happened in this video game happens in the rest of the story, just in a very bad, messed up way. Um, because otherwise you've missed a great opportunity. And then one of the other critiquers were like, well, wait a minute now, this was worked really well um, because it, it showed me the, the character of this character. I'm like, yes, it does. That is that is exactly right. But if that's all it does, then it's a massive missed opportunity. Um, and I don't remember exactly, I don't know if we ever, because I don't really ask the writers a question. I'm just, I give them, you know, just like you should give him advice, give him what we see and we feel. Um, so he may have been thinking that or, you know, he may not have. But a lot of writers will will put things in the story that just is cool at that moment and and don't realize the potential of what it could be in the future. So I hope you're right. I really, really hope you're right. You're a brilliant storyteller. Um, you also could be blue curtaining it. Um, I could be blue curtaining it. And for those of you who don't know, blue curtaining... So there was a professor who waxed lyrical about the meaning of the color blue in a scene because, you know, the writer specified blue curtains. 
And then somebody asked the writer about how he came up with all of these metaphors for blue. And he looked at them and was like, look, the curtains are blue because the curtains in my hotel room where I was writing the scene were blue. <laughs> so. And I got to the curtain description and I looked around the room and I was like, uh, the curtains are blue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's actually a meme. I don't think that actually happened. That's a story that we tell about yeah. it. But um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, you you the proof is in the pudding. I mean, that's the thing. And again, what we talked about at the beginning of this, how you're going to decide whether you've done your job or not, you're not. Yeah. The audience is. Absolutely. And so, and so I will know in season two right. how how strong they fed off that, that arrogant story arc. But the reason why I feel it didn't come through strongly enough for like everybody to be talking about this is because they muddied the crap out of the waters. Yeah. They they she was constantly moving from place to place. And the problem with an arrogant storyline is you need to show the effect of that arrogance constantly on people. Well, and it needs, you know, there's another reason for it. And we yeah. talked about this yesterday or yeah, yesterday when we were just uh, meeting. Um, Cause you're right. hundred percent. They, they did wash it down in the story, but they also did not utilize the space of the story that they had. So here's where we talk about, to tie this back into this, they had too many character arcs that they had to give time to. And that's why none of them. And they only had 10 episodes because they're, right. they're one of those super expensive overpriced shows that can only afford 10 episodes. Right. All right. But you have to write within the limitations of your time constraints. They could have cut the grimdark halflings. Nobody needed grimdark hobbits in their lives. Like, <laughs> nobody. You, you give me $500 million to make a TV show, I'm going to give you 50 episodes minimum. Like, I'm going <laughs> to give you a TV show that's going to run the whole stinking year. Yeah. Because I, I don't know where you're going to spend that money. But anyway, so yeah. so this ties into what we were saying earlier about who should get a story arc? Now, it's TV, and there's a it's a different me. I mean, you know, as a novelist, one of the beautiful things about a novelist is you're beholden to no one. Even when I was working in the industry, and so you know, I'm beholden to selling to publishers. They either buy it or they don't. And yes, if they buy it, they're always like, "Oh, we'd like you to change this aspect, or we'd like you to change this character." And then you either do it or you don't. It depends on if you want the money or not. But you're still pretty much an island. You're still pretty much reliant on what you feel is the right thing based off of either your beta readers or just your, your own arrogance or whatever. But you get into something like that, something in this TV, and you've got you've got the writers, you've got directors, you've got actors, you've got producers and executives and, and, and it's, people that don't know dick about storytelling. It's Amazon, so you have Jeff Bezos with his finger on the scale, you know? Right, right. <laughs> so you have so many things that... You know, so that's the other thing is that you forced me to actually think about before this podcast that I'd never really thought about. You know, I'm mad at Ring of Power because it could have been so much more. And you forced me to go, you know what? Technically, even though I have hammered on the writers, you know, ever since it came out, technically, I, I mean, I was writing a movie script. Uh, it never went anywhere. But um, I'm literally in the throes of writing it. And it is a kind of a horror type thing. It was a sci-fi thing, but the producer calls me up and says, Hey, I need you to write in a scene that has a three-year-old baby in it. And I'm like, what? Like, yeah, there's a guy that's going to invest like 50 million or 20 million, $10 million, whatever it was. Um, and his daughter's pregnant. And so when we go into production, this child will be probably about three years old. So I need you, you know, he won't, he's not going to invest if we don't have a scene for his granddaughter or grandbaby, whatever it was. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's not happening. And he's like, yeah, it is. That's what you needed. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not happening. I'm, I'm not. No, I'm not doing it. It's it's not happening. <laughs> uh, so it, like, I'm not kidding when I say you have no idea yeah. what these people think and how they, you know, come down on writers and everything like that. Um, and I mean, I'm just a writer who won't put my name on something for money. I just yeah. won't. I'd rather just be broke. <laughs> 
And, and and I mean that's that's the thing is like you know the the rings of power writers they're all contracted they're all sitting in a writers room whatever and and you know you know that they use these mini rooms and all of that crap right so um so I don't I don't actually blame them per se but there were too many arcs can can, can I can I take a yeah? can I chase a rabbit yeah because I hear that all the time not just from you, but from other people. And I just don't think that's a good excuse. When they're like, oh, but writers' room, rooms used to be eight people and now they're, and then they went to six and now they're four. Oh, no, no. Look, that's, that's not me my and problem. You, yeah. Me and you in three hours, I, so, you know, would just me bouncing I'll off stuff. You, yeah, yeah, 100%. But I'll tell you what the problem is with a smaller writers' room and with a writers' room that are so short is it's a training problem. Right. All right. Because because you no longer have large writing room, you can't have junior writers right. who just yeah. sit in the back and not contribute. Because, 100%. And so how do people who are, you know, just getting into writing, how do they right. learn? They have no way to right. learn. But I mean, like I said, yeah. being a no, novelist, no. like no one, yeah. there was no writing room for, for you or me yeah. when we sat down 100%. to write our first novel. We just yeah. did it. 100%. And so I, I don't know. I just, like I said, I, mean, I got but, beat but in so can't... many different... The the problem is like TV is a is a different medium and you it can't is. just write. Yeah. You know? So, but anyway, regardless, the the problem with with Rings of Powers is, as I say, they just they they muddied the crap out of the waters. They were telling too many stories, and so they couldn't give Galadriel's arrogant story the breathing room it needed to really blossom. Hundred percent. And yeah. they rushed. Like I think that they should have put off the actual forging of the rings till season two. I think she should have gotten Halbrand into the same room and then they should have spent the next season forging the rings. Yeah. I think that that would have given them also time to tell the story. Yeah. And because, I mean... And the words elves will not replace us should never have come out of a character's mouth. I don't know who was thinking what there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but story space is a very serious thing. I mean, both of us write... Um, you know, everything from epic fantasy to, you know, we got the magic falls, the skies of destiny, which are, you know, 80,000 words, 75,000, 80,000 words. You know, I'm working on a 15, 18,000, actually, I'm working on two novellas and then one short story. And so you have, as, as a story creator, you have to go, okay, I've got this much space. I want to explore this many things. I'm going to explore this thing. Because I've got this much space. And Focus so you do space. have to, you do have to live by that. I mean, even though, you know, both of us are in the indie press world, technically, the only limitation we have is how small do you make want to make the font? Because you only have so many pages in the book. Yeah. So you can make the font, you know, like microscopic <laughs> and have a ton of story. But, you know, that's really our only limitation. Or you could break it up into two volumes. But we still have a limitation. We, we still have, this is how big the story is. And and let me tell you, you will lose readers at those doorstop, at, at books that are beyond, you know, oh, yeah. beyond the pale. But like, I mean, it's even it's even more than that. So like, um, I just got hired by Harn World. I'm doing novellas for them. I'm doing a 25,000 word novella every quarter. That's my contract. Um, I'm not going to get paid for more. Not, and I'm going to, but I will get paid less for less. So like I have 25,000 words. So when we, when I sat down with the, um, the dev team, they're writers, but I don't like to use that term because it muddies the water as far as, because they're, they're a different yeah. type of writer. They're a game writer versus a prose yeah. writer. So they're the development team of the game. So when I sit down with them um, and go over things, you know, they're excited. They're throwing things out of me because I'm the first prose writer that they've ever had. This is the first time Harn World has ever, you know, in 40 years has stepped into writing stories. Um, I mean, technically there was something in the past, but they try not to talk about that. Um, so they're throwing things at me and I'm like, yeah, I don't have time. I don't have time to do that. Like, let's focus on this. I got 25,000 words. Like, this is the story that we're, that I'm going to tell in this moment. Now we can explore other things in other times, but this. Yeah. So, you know. You have but, to stick, you have to stick with it. And this is the problem. If you don't stick within your space of your story if you try and cram too much in what's going to happen is you're going to cut 
critical parts that aren't perhaps the exact beats, because that's the thing. They had the exact beats for Galadriel, but they had none of the extra moments that makes the story breathe and that gives the reader satisfaction. It was like a train ride to a destination as opposed to a gentle, you know, um, boat ride or, or like a carriage ride. It was just like a bullet train heading to a place. Yeah. Same problem with Game of Thrones season eight, in fact. Um, bullet train. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, you you have to, as a storyteller, understand how much space you have available. And it's so funny because I just realized I need to do that in my life. Like I take on a million <laughs> products, even though I don't, or projects, even though I don't have the bandwidth to actually do it. And yet I won't take on a story element that is bigger than the space that I have. So I guess I just realized that I'm an idiot um, yep. because I'm really good at the story side and really horrible at real life. But I, I learned to do that in real life because what you, what you say yes to means you're saying no to something else, or at the yeah. very least you're saying no to quality because there yeah. are only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the reason why I'm, notoriously so as a writer because i don't say no to anything so i don't say no to somebody asked me to do something and then i don't say no to quality so <laughs> time i'm well actually no you're right i am saying no to something i'm saying no to some being on time that's what i'm saying no to you're saying no to meeting deadlines yep yeah no 100 percent. and i need to get better at that um so i mean i think that ties everything in to what we're talking about so if you buy into the fact that your character arc is tied into your thematic element, that it's a delivery mechanism. It's not a cool character. It needs to be a cool character. I'm not saying that. The reader needs to see it as a cool character. But from a structural standpoint, it's not a cool character. It's a UPS delivery vehicle. That's all it is. It's there to deliver the theme, which means it has to have an arc, which means it has to, you know, have start somewhere and then change and grow and everything like that. And again, there's other types of stories, but we're talking about the main thrust of what you're going to do if you're a genre fiction writer. And if you buy into that, then you also need to buy into the fact there's only so much time to give it. And so since you can't mention anything, you've got to look for very intelligent, organic ways to make sure that the reader is consuming the message without you ever mentioning the message. And so therefore, how do you make a good character arc is it's a structural thing, in my opinion. It's a, it's a, and I, I say this in my class too, because um, I just did my theme class this month. The only thing a reader walks away with is the theme. They don't walk away with your cool characters. They don't walk away with blowing up Death Stars. They don't walk away with slaying dragons. Those things all, you know, they'll remember them or whatever. But what they walk away with is what it, the story made them feel. So if you think back to a story that you read 10 years ago, I mean, you just said it today. Like, I do you remember any massive details about the, five, what'd you call it? The five... The famous five, no. The famous five, no. But you do remember how you felt. Yeah. And that comes from the theme. That's really what it comes from. If if the, the stories have theme that impact you on a human level, they make you feel something and you remember that feeling. You do not remember the details of the story. And so that's what a character arc is. So if you want to understand whether you succeeded or not with your character arc is, does it make the reader feel something on a thematic level? Because level? then they will remember that as they go forward and if it doesn't it doesn't matter how cool i mean you're basically michael bang the story so i don't not only did the shia labeouf character's story arc in transformers not impact me i don't remember the character's name i have no like like now don't get me wrong love transformers it was great eye-catching big big robot killing thing explosion stuff I will never watch it again because I've already been there. I've already seen it. I got my enjoyment out of it. It was a visual enjoyment, which is why it can only happen in the visual medium. Mm -hmm. But it's not, I don't, it, it didn't, it, it, if I never see that movie again, I won't even notice. My life will not change in a, a flea's breath way. So, because it has no, themes it has nothing that's going to it's not like the Shawshank Redemption or even Jurassic Park if you want to talk about the exact same type of movie yet Jurassic Park made me feel something therefore I remember it fondly if I get a chance to see it again I'll watch it again you know 
And so that's what storytellers really have to lock into. And so when we talk about story story arcs, I know so many people lock into, oh, but you got to have, you know, this cool character thing that's going to do this, you know, it's going to slay dragons. And no, it has to make the reader feel something. Yeah. And I think that's how you decide whether the character arc is successful or not. I think that that, that is a good place in which to end this episode. And we will see you soon for another one. Bye. Good day to our esteemed listeners. I'm Marie Mullaney, and it has been a pleasure guiding you through the nuances of writing and world building. If our podcast has enriched your authorial journey in any way, please consider liking and subscribing. Sharing our content with your peers is a powerful way to support our mission and ensure we continue to deliver insightful and valuable episodes. Your engagement is greatly appreciated. If today's topic sparked your interest, then Just In Time Worlds on YouTube is where you should be heading next. It's a channel dedicated to the art of fantasy world building, infused with real world history and science. As an experienced role player and fantasy author, I bring unique insights that will help you craft more immersive and believable fantasy worlds. From historical tidbits to practical writing advice, Just In Time Worlds is a wealth of knowledge for any fantasy creator or enthusiast. Join us every Tuesday for new and exciting content. If you are ready to take your writing to the next level and work with a group of highly motivated, dedicated writers who are all working to not only improve their writing, but improve your writing, plus you get to work with me on a weekly basis, then I'll encourage you to check out writersroom.us. This is a website that I have created that I really wish I had 30 years ago. It's everything a writer needs to become a better writer. Not only do we do weekly critique sessions, both from other members as well as me, we have daily writing sessions, I do monthly classes, Q&As, we have activities, I do uh, all sorts of learning exercises such as I do a quarterly writing prompt contest and just tons and tons and tons of things. So if you're ready to get serious about your writing and you want to actually finish that novel and have a chance of it being published, then I encourage you to head on over to the writer's room and join me there. And as a special promotion for listeners of Releasing Your Inner Dragon, I'll go one step more. If you would like to get 50% off for three months, reach out to me. There's a million ways you can do that. You can do it through StarvingWriterStudio.com, DrakeU.com, any of my social medias such as LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, X, whatever. Reach out to me. Say that you would like to check out the Writer's Room for 50% off, and I will send you a link that will allow you to do just that. So hopefully you're ready to start getting serious about writing, and I'll see you in the Writer's Room.